Please turn in your Bibles to the first book of Timothy, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties or intercessions and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men. For kings who are in authority, in order that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity, etc. Intercessions and prayers. Paul draws a distinction. When you look at Hebrew and Greek, you see there's a big distinction between prayer and intercession. I see the term intercession and intercessory prayer being used very loosely in a very unbiblical way, particularly in charismatic and Pentecostal circles. The reason for that is, of course, Pentecostals and charismatics have reached a place where the theology is based on experience instead of on the Word of God. And so experience and feelings and what they want to believe or some kind of tradition or pronouncement by man basically eclipses the authority of Scripture. Now, the old-time Pentecostals knew their Bibles. Pentecostals have never had many Greek scholars or Hebrew scholars, but at least the old-time Pentecostals knew their Bibles. That's eroding. Very few Pentecostal ministers today have any theological training whatsoever in this country, and that will be fine, providing they knew the Word of God, but compared to the old-time Pentecostals, that is certainly eroded. I have a friend who's an Anglican theologian, an evangelical Anglican theologian, and I asked him how a certain bishop could write a book saying crazy things, telling people to follow people who predict things that don't happen. And he said, it's very simple. In our Anglican seminaries, for decades, we've been learning higher criticism, not doctrine. So therefore, because the ministers and the vicars in the Church of England have never been taught doctrine for the last 40, 50 years, the word of some crackpot from America takes the place of doctrine, such as the case of charismaticism and Pentecostalism as it is today. It is not difficult to see why Christianity is exploding in the poor countries but declining in the rich ones. It's not difficult to see why people are being born again in large numbers in the countries that didn't have the Reformation. In Eastern Europe, the Roman Catholic countries are where the most people are getting saved. The Protestant countries that had the Reformation, it is declining. If you were to go throughout Latin America today, you'd see tremendous, tremendous revivals. What happened in Europe during the Reformation is today happening in the Roman Catholic world. The Philippines, South America, Brazil. Once again, every week in Santiago, Chile, 20,000 people leave the Roman Catholic Church every week and become Pentecostals. In Guatemala, 10% of the population left the Roman Catholic Church in 10 years' time. That's beginning in the Philippines now. It's certainly widespread in the United States. And even now, in the countries of Europe that didn't have the Reformation, you're beginning to see God work in the countries that did not have the Reformation. While in the Protestant countries like England, Christianity, biblical Christianity particularly, is declining. In its place, idolatry, New Age, paganism, interfaith, etc. Nonetheless, let's look at this idea of intercession. It's interesting, the clearest place where Paul exhorts people to it is when he says to pray for government and for leaders. The book of Daniel tells us a lot about this. The idea of marashot in Hebrew, archaic in Greek, principalities in English. If the political leaders are not coming under the influence of God, they're going to become under the influence of the God of this world. And look what's happening once again to this society. Just look what's happening to it. The so-called party of Back to Basics, their spokesman for Back to Basics, he died dressed in women's stockings, suspenders, and a plastic bag over his head, and an act of autoeroticism. He was the spokesman for Back to Basics. Now, I keep my political views separate from the Bible, but that's what happened. A woman from this same party, not that the other party is any different, she just introduced a bill the other day to allow a middle-aged, homosexual man to seduce a 16-year-old boy. That was the party of Back to Basics. God knows what the other parties would do. This country is in very serious moral decline. It is in very serious spiritual decline. 
And even so, you can give intellectual explanations to the economic and political decline of Britain. Underneath the political and economic decline, the real reasons are spiritual and theological. This country is failing because its church is failing. And its church is failing because it's compromised. But Paul begins talking about intercession in the context of praying for leaders. I firmly believe that God wants to give this backslidden nation one more chance to repent before Jesus comes. There are no formulas for revival, no formulae, none. There are only principles. God can be petitioned, he cannot be manipulated. We live in an age where people are reinterpreting the gospel in light of their worldview. That's what people are doing. We live in a Western consumer society. So people are reinterpreting the gospel in light of Western consumerism. We call it prosperity theology. It's not biblical, but that's what people are teaching. They're just taking the Bible and reinterpreting it in light of their worldview. Christian feminism. People just taking the feminism of the world and reinterpreting the gospel in light of their worldview. A hyperemphasis on demons and deliverance. We live in a push-button society. Push the button on the microwave and get the result you want. That's people's mentality. So therefore, instead of living the crucified life, picking up our cross and following Jesus, we want to push the button. You see the same people getting the demons cast out every other week. That's what people are doing. We live in a multi-ethnic society, multicultural society, so what are people doing? Interfaith worship, ecumenical worship, they're reinterpreting the gospel in light of their social experience to suit themselves. That's what people are doing. We live in a high-tech society. Get the right software program, and your hardware will do what you want. If you get the right program for your computer, you'll get the right results. So people will come up with an evangelistic gimmick based on secular advertising ideas. Here, if you get this program, you're going to get this result. Now, I'm not going to knock anything, because if it sees one, people, one person say it's worth it, I don't care how much it costs. But the idea you're going to see revival because you get the right program is absurd. Every revival begins by people praying for it, but not just praying for it, interceding for it. Every revival in the history of the church began with intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer has to do with grieving, mourning, being hurt, and being abused because of what's happening around you. Of all the programs and formulas I see people designed to bring revival to Britain, I don't see anybody talking about repentance, about being grieved, about being sunken in spirit because of what has happened to this once upon a time Christian nation. Instead, it's hype, hype, prosperity, kingdom now, the rest of it. There's no easy way out of the mess this country is in. This city was the greatest port in the world. Go out there and walk around and look at Top Step, look at Speak, look at Boodle, look at what has happened to the greatest port in the world. Things have gone this far for this long, there is no easy way out. But the first step is going to be intercession. What is the difference between prayer and intercession? A brief lesson in Greek and Hebrew. In English, Webster and Oxford, they say things like, to plead or to entreat on behalf of another. People are making prayer or entreating on behalf of another synonymous with intercession. It is not. Intercession is not that. I want to look at the Hebrew mainly because the Greek ideas of intercession in the New Testament are simply translated from the Hebrew ones in the Old, from the, via the Septuagint. But let's look briefly at the Greek one. In 1 Timothy 2, 1, as we just read, it's entuxis. It means a meeting between, a meeting between. But then in Romans 8, 26, it's different. In Romans 8, 26, it talks about how the Holy Spirit himself intercedes. That word is different. He parententioni. By technical definition, it means to come between, to come between. 
a meeting between and to come between. The Holy Spirit comes between us and God. But the Hebrew concepts are much more meaningful. Intercession in Hebrew has two basic terms. One is lechavgia. Hebrew lechavgia. It is related to the word lifgoa, meaning to meet. Lifgoa, to meet. But lechavgia is to intercede. Now, Hebrew is a language based on roots called shortishes or shortashim in Hebrew. And the idea of lehavdiyah is what you call in Hebrew a heat eel of lingoa, of lifgoa, meaning to meet. It means to cause somebody to act, to cause somebody to meet. So you are causing a meeting. But this root, this shortish, is paga, paga, three letters. If I were to translate it to English, it would be P-G-A, roughly, pay gimel ein. It means to meet. But its real meaning is not simply to meet, but it means to meet as in to strike, to bruise, or to wound, to touch with the intent of hurting, even to kill. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 45. Second Samuel chapter 1. And David said to him, How do these things go? Please tell me. And he said, The people have fled from the battle, and also many of the people have fallen and are dead. And Saul, Saul also and Jonathan, his sons, are dead. So David said to the young man who told him, How do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? And the young man who told him, by chance I happened to be on Mount Gilboa, and behold, Saul was leaning on his spear, and behold, the chariots and horsemen pursued him closely. That idea of being pursued closely, and he's met, and he's wounded, is paga, paga. The person comes close to him in order to slay him. In Judges 18.25, it's yifga'u, a fatal meeting, a fatal meeting to meet in order to fall upon or to kill, yifka'u. Finally, in Ruth 116, there's another term, but it's the same root, tifga'i, meaning to plead or to urge. The basic idea of intercession is paga, paga, to be bruised, on behalf of someone else, to be bruised on behalf of someone else and to cause a meeting for that purpose, to cause a meeting for that purpose. If someone goes into intercessory prayer, they are going into it to be bruised, to be bruised. When you pray for someone, you're not expecting to be bruised on behalf of that person, but you are expected to be bruised if you're going to intercede. You're going to cause to meet for the purpose of being bruised. There is one place only in the entire Bible where the two terms seem to be used interchangeably, and that's in Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 16. As for you, do not pray for this people, and do not lift up a cry or prayer for them, and do not intercede with me, for I do not hear you. Don't pray for them and don't intercede for them. Don't do either one. Praying for somebody might help them. Interceding for somebody has much more power. But Israel reached a point where even intercession wouldn't work anymore. That's my fear for the Western countries. That is my fear for the Western countries. What was the state of Israel when this happened in the days of Jeremiah? They were sacrificing their babies to demons. Other gods in Hebrew are called Shedim, demons, the Manoi in Greek. If you've never heard me point it out or anyone point it out before, in Great Britain, if you were to take all of the clinical reasons for abortion and put them together, ectopic pregnancy, vaginal cancer, 
Radio-induced mutagenesis in a fetus due to accidental exposure of radiation. If you were to take all of the clinical reasons for abortion and put them together, they would only account for a very small per percentage of the abortions performed in the United Kingdom, the United States, Germany, or any other Western country. Almost all abortions are performed for non-therapeutic reasons. In other words, for social and economic considerations. In other words, <clears throat> what Jesus called the worship of mammon. God's judgment fell on Israel because they were sacrificing their babies to demons. Make no mistake about it, non-therapeutic abortion is theologically and spiritually a form of demon worship. And God's judgment will fall upon Great Britain and America for the same thing. They reached the point when they took these ultimate emblems of God's love and sacrificed them to demons that God said, no more. You think of a baby. Once again, the kind of love that parents have for their baby, God created that kind of love to teach how much he loves us. A parent would give its life for its baby. When you take that ultimate emblem of God's love, that you'd give your own life for it. Once again, God creates that kind of love that you'd give your life for that baby to teach how he loves us. That's how Jesus died on the cross for us. You understand? He gave his life for us, and the kind of love he gave, gives us for our own babies, it's a, it's a, the Greek term is storga, it's the highest form of love an unsaved person is capable of. It's the closest thing to agape you can get. Only a born-again Christian can have agape love. Once you take these ultimate emblems of God's love and sacrifice them to a demon, that society has gone too far. God's judgment is coming. If anything can stop it, it's going to begin with intercessory prayer. Once you begin sacrificing demons, babies to demons, that society has gone too far. This land and Western civilization is in very serious trouble. Judgment is coming. Forget about the prosperity people. Forget about the kingdom now people. Judgment is coming. But let's continue. In Hebrew, we have another word for prayer called halel. That means to praise. Supplication is tehina, to ask for. The modern word is lehit palel, lehit palel, to pray to. Different words for different kinds of prayer. But the Hebrew word for worship is lehishtahavot, lehishtahavot from hishtak vaya. It means literally to bow down, to prostrate, to genuflect. When you see someone genuflecting before a statue, that is an act of idolatry. Read the book of Esther. The Jewish feast of Purim is today. It happened because they would not bow the knee to Haman. When you see someone bowing down before a graven image in the original Hebrew, that is an act of idolatry. In Israel, we had a big problem when I was a missionary on Mount Carmel. The Orthodox Jews persecuted us because we believed Jesus was the Messiah. And the Muslims hated the Muslim Christians. But there was a big problem. They carried a statue called Our Lady of Mount Carmel from the top of Mount Carmel down into the center of the city. It's the same place where Astaroth was worshipped in the pagan world. They just Maryized Astaroth. And they carried the statue down and they bowed down before it and sing Ave Maria and all this kind of stuff. When the Jews and Muslims see what they can only understand correctly as an act of idolatry, they say, this is Christianity, we don't want to worship idols. So then the true believers, the Bible-believing Christians, had to go out and try to give these people the gospel when they see this idolatry. These same kinds of spiritual counterfeits you have in Nak and Madrigori and, and, and Guadalupe, you've got the same thing in Israel. And that's, that, those deceptions will increase before Jesus comes. I had a friend who was a Carmelite monk named Gregory. He was a charismatic Catholic. He'd come to our meetings and raise his hands, and he'd be one of us. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. But then, when it was time to get the statue out, there he was with his candle singing Ave Maria, worshipping his idols. Poor man. Those are the main Hebrew words for prayer. The histahavot, to bow down to worship. The halel, to praise. Tehina, to ask for. But to intercede comes from paga. Paga, lift goa. To meet, but lechav to be bruised or to cause oneself even to be bruised. 
It's interesting, the Hebrew word lehit palel is related to criminal law, hok pliah, the idea of you taking the judgment for somebody else. To summarize then, to meet, to hurt or to wound, to meet with the purpose of to hurt or to wound, and then in that being wounded, to plead. Associated with prayer, maybe even a form of prayer, but not prayer per se. Now this obviously is Jesus on the cross. Look at Isaiah 53, verse 6, please. Where you have the Hebrew word, paga. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. That idea to fall on is the same Hebrew infinitive. He gets bruised. This meeting happens and he gets bruised. Hifgia, lechavgia, to meet in order to be hurt. But it uses a very strong Hebrew term, ba, ba. Yehovah Hidgiya Boet Avon Kulanu. It was the pleasure of the Lord to bruise him or to injure him. It's here on Isaiah 53 that we really see the perfect picture of intercession. But what was Jesus doing on the cross? Was Jesus praying for us on the cross? Jesus wasn't praying for us on the cross simply, was he? Jesus was being tortured for us on the cross. He was being bruised for us on the cross. He was standing in the gap doing something for ourselves, for, for us that we could never do for ourselves on the cross. When you see people confusing prayer with intercession, it's like saying that on the cross, Jesus was just praying for us. Jesus was not praying for us. He was spilling out his life, his blood, and his guts for us. There's a big difference between prayer and intercession. Man was fallen. Man was desperate. Man was in a hopeless situation. So it took God to come in the form of man to make that intercession. That principle of intercession will always hold true. When a society is dying like this one, it's going to require self-giving intercession to turn it around. Prayer is one thing, but intercession is something again. Let me explain it this way. You have a Hebrew word, masa, meaning burden. The Holy Spirit takes the burden of someone and puts it on the intercessor. God took our sins and the burden for our sins and the Holy Spirit put it on Jesus. He didn't do anything, but he takes the blame. If you are going to go into intercessory prayer, God is going to take the burden of Jesus for the person, persons, or nation you are interceding for. Because Jesus has a burden for whole nations as well as for people. And he will take that burden and he will put it on you. Prayer is one thing. Intercession is another. If you're talking about intercessory prayer, you're talking about a burden. You're talking about being bruised. That's what it takes. In the eyes of God, you become identified with the person or thing or nation you are interceding for. So when God looks upon Jesus on the cross, he sees us, our sin, our old nature. When you begin interceding for somebody, God doesn't see you, he sees that person you're interceding for. The burden that Jesus himself carries. Jesus knows every hurt. He knows every sin. He knows all the anguish and injustice in the world. And when you want to intercede, what you're saying is, Father, send your Holy Spirit to take that burden from your son that he's carrying for this person or for this church or for this nation and put it on me. That's what you're saying. It's a lot more than prayer, isn't it? So as a result, in the sight of God, we become identified with the person 
we're praying for. You yourself become wounded on behalf of the person you're praying for. Prayer is objective. Intercession is subjective. We can pray for Auntie Lily's hysterectomy or Cousin Felix and his teenage skin problem. And that's all there is to it. We finish praying for them, and that's the end of it. But when we intercede, that's not the end of it. When you pray, it is purely objective. When you intercede, it is subjective. You begin to pray like you're praying for yourself, like it's you going into that surgery, like it's you going into that operating theater, like it's your wife or your son who's dying of cancer. Prayer is objective. Intercession is subjective. Jesus felt every pain on the cross. He carried our burden. And in intercession, that's what happens. The Holy Spirit takes that burden and puts it on us to win the victory for somebody who can't win it for themselves. Let's look at Isaiah 53. It's the perfect chapter to describe the ministry of intercession. We call him in Hebrew, Ishayahu Hanavi. The same Hebrew root as Jewish, Yeshua, Ishayahu, meaning salvation. And in verse 3, he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him stricken. You look at the big prosperity preachers running around today with their big clothes and big cars and big hotels. You look at them and compare them to the kinds of people in the Bible that God used to turn nations around. They were men of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Look at Isaiah, look at Jeremiah, look at the lives they lived. Those people carried a burden. Verse 5. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. He was crushed for us. Do you really want to intercede? Are you willing to be crushed for the person or the persons or nation you're going to intercede for? Because if you really want to intercede, you're going to be crushed. But let's continue. Verse 6, the word paga. We all have gone astray, and each turns to his own way. But the Lord caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. It's one thing to intercede for your Auntie Hazel who brought you chicken soup when you had the measles. It's one thing to intercede for people you love and care about. But Jesus interceded for his enemies. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When I was a drug addict hustling drugs in New York, Jesus had paid the price for my sins. When I was pimping off girls in New York to support my drug habit, Jesus was paying the price for my sins. When I was embezzling money with the computer, Jesus was paying the price for my sins. And if he didn't pay the price for my sins, I'd still be doing those things, providing I'd be alive, which is another question. I was so sick and depraved. Thank God for anybody who prayed for me. But I really thank God for the one who interceded for me. Amen. Interceding for Auntie Hazel, who you love so much, is one thing. But to intercede for your enemies. The early Christians prayed for the people who persecuted them. Make no mistake about it, there's a persecution coming to the Bible-believing church in this country. Sooner or later, it's going to come. Can we pray and intercede for the ones who persecute us? Things will get bad before they get better. Verse 4. Our griefs he bore, our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. It's a very lonely thing to be an intercessor. I see people running around talking about, I'm an intercessor. If you're an intercessor, 
<laughs> you don't have to tell people. They wouldn't know what you're talking about anyway because it's so lonely. You feel abandoned and helpless. How did Jesus feel on the cross? He felt abandoned and he felt helpless. Verse 9. He had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. He had nothing to do with the situation that God put him in. But he willingly accepted the cross. God will never force you to intercede. He'll never force you to take that burden. You have to be willing to accept it. In verse 10, he was put to grief on behalf of others. Verse 11, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. In other words, intercession, it's like an alcoholic going on a drunk. In the beginning, Everything seems good when an alcoholic begins drinking, but then it catches up with him, and then everything gets bad. But when he tries to stop drinking, the opposite happens. First comes the shakes and DTs and the rest of it. The bad things come first, then the good things come afterwards. Do you know what I mean? Intercession is not something to be feared, because intercession trusts God for the result. In 1 Corinthians 14, 19, Paul says to pray with your mind. Pray with your mind. In intercession, you reach a point where you become so powerless that the burden crushes you. And at times, you can't pray with your mind. That's very often where the gift of tongues can be of practical value. We can only call out to God to help us because we're too crushed to do anything. We become as helpless as Jesus was on the cross and as helpless and unable to help ourselves as the people we're interceding for. When the Holy Spirit puts somebody's burden on us, he's putting on us the burden that Jesus carries for that person. We subjectively have their pain and their helplessness. But once again, look at Isaiah 53. What happens? In verse 11, as a result or because of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. Those he interceded for were delivered. And because he did it in verse 12, he was allotted a portion with the great. It's the same for us. Through persevering through intercession, the victory is won. And intercessors are going to be allotted a portion with the great. They'll be allotted a portion with the great. When Jesus resolved to go to the cross, he knew exactly what he was in for. And if you're going into intercessory prayer, you should know exactly what you are in for. It's associated with fasting and a lot of other things, but the main concept is being bruised. Intercessors will be allotted a portion with the great. But let's continue. What happened to Jesus on the cross? On the cross, Jesus was our high priest making intercession. Look at Hebrews 7, 25. Hence also he is able to save forever those who draw near to him, to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for him. Think about it. The apostles were in a boat being storm-tossed in Mark 6. In Mark 4, Jesus was in the boat, but in Mark 6, he wasn't. They didn't know where Jesus was. They thought Jesus abandoned them. 
But Jesus didn't abandon them. He was on the mountain making intercession for them. And I've lived in Galilee for a long time. My children are born there. You can stand on top of the hills of Galilee near Capernaum, and you can see a small fishing boat in the moonlight, the Dugit they would have been called, and Jesus would have seen the whole thing. And he's making intercession. When we go through trouble and tribulation, Jesus is interceding for us still. What you're doing in intercessory prayer is joining him in doing it. You understand? You become a partaker with Christ in his ministry of intercession for his bride, for his church, for his people. Think about Moses. When he put his hands down, they began to lose the battle. But he couldn't keep his hands up because he was old and he needed people to help him, didn't he? Think about it. The apostles were in a boat being storm-tossed in Mark 6. In Mark 4, Jesus was in the boat, but in Mark 6, he wasn't. They didn't know where Jesus was. They thought Jesus abandoned them. But Jesus didn't abandon them. He was on the mountain making intercession for them. And I've lived in Galilee for a long time. My children are born there. You can stand on top of the hills of Galilee near Capernaum, and you can see a small fishing boat in the moonlight, the Dugit they would have been called, and Jesus would have seen the whole thing. And he's making intercession. When we go through trouble and tribulation, Jesus is interceding for us still. What you're doing in intercessory prayer is joining him in doing it. You understand? You become a partaker with Christ in his ministry of intercession for his bride, for his church, for his people. Think about Moses. When he put his hands down, they began to lose the battle. But he couldn't keep his hands up because he was old and he needed people to help him, didn't he? Joshua and Caleb and so on, they joined him in the battle. When the Holy Spirit calls somebody to intercession, he's inviting you to join Jesus in the battle. There doesn't seem to be much action when Moses is, but as long as Moses had his hands up, that battle was going to be won. When the hands go down, the battle is lost. And the battle for the gospel in Great Britain, by any reasonable analysis of the statistics, is being lost. In this country, most people who ever go to church will only go because of a rite of passage. Somebody gets married, somebody dies, somebody gets buried, whatever. Less than 10% of the people will attend any kind of a church on any kind of a regular basis. But let's look at the high priest. Jesus, we're told in Hebrews, is our high priest. There's still a temple, the church, and there's still a high priest, that's Jesus, Yeshua. The author is a type of the cross, is a type of the altar, or the altar is a type of the cross. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, he was the high priest making a sacrifice, making intercession for our sin. You understand? It's like the high priest making intercessory sacrifice on the altar. That's what he was doing. The cross is the altar and Jesus is the priest. We have to understand about the typology of the high priest. Look at Exodus 28, verse 12. In Hebrew, we call Exodus Shemot. Exodus 28, verse 12. And you shall put two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as stones of memorial, Hebrew word is zikaron, for the sons of Israel and Aaron. And they shall bear the names before the Lord on his two shoulders for a memorial. But then in that same chapter, let's look at verses 29 and 30. And Aaron shall carry the names of the sons of Israel in the breastpiece of judgment over his heart when he enters the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. And you shall put in the breastpiece of judgment 
the Ordem and Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. And Aaron shall carry the judgment of the sons of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. Continually. The high priest garments, the two people I've seen do monkey tricks with it, the worst are the Mormons and Rick Godwin. They both take the high priest garments and do ridiculous things with them. The Mormons go so far as to have this underwear they never take off. Literally. They have this problem with babies are being born, they cut it, and it must get pretty funky. <laughs> the thing is, he had the name of the tribes of Israel on his shoulder and on his heart, and he couldn't take it off. You understand? He had to carry that burden all the time, continually. When you pray for somebody, you pray for them, and then you forget about it, and you move on and pray for the next thing. You pray for the government. You pray for your friend. You pray for your parents to get saved. You pray for your exams in university. You pray for a job. You pray for your unemployed friends to get a job. You do this. You pray for that. And then you forget about it and move on and pray for the next thing. Intercession is not like that. You carry that burden. It stays on your shoulders, and it stays on your heart until that burden is removed. And that burden is removed by the God who put it there when the victory is won, and not a minute sooner. You carry that burden. Prayer is objective. Intercession is subjective. It's good to pray for somebody, but intercession is totally different. If you really want to go into intercessory prayer, you have to realize you're going to carry the burden. It's going to be on your shoulders, and it's going to be on your heart, and it's not going to go away until the victory is won. But when that victory is won, it's worth it. People will grieve over the loss of a loved one, and they can't sleep, and they think about it in bed at night. And they're on their way to work thinking about it, and I can't believe he's gone, I can't believe she's gone, whatever. It's always on their mind that it just takes time for it to get, get something you can manage. Intercession is like that. It doesn't go away. The burden haunts you. It haunts you. People who intercede will fall out of bed in the middle of the night and beg God for the person or the nation they're interceding for because they can't sleep. Sometimes they don't even know what to say anymore because they're too weak, too powerless, like Jesus was on the cross. That burden, it doesn't go away. In Exodus 28, 33 to 37, we see something of the typology of the high priest's garment. First of all, the purple and scarlet. One is a kingly color, but the scarlet has to do with Isaiah 118. Your sins are like scarlet, they shall be pure as snow. The first significance, then, is one of repentance. But secondly, the high priest around the hem of his garment had to have bells for entering the Holy of Holies. The father of John the Baptist on Yom Kippur went into the Holy of Holies to make atonement. In the first temple, Solomon's temple, when the ark was there, they would fasten a leather rope around the high priest's ankle and he'd go on back of the curtain before the ark of the Lord. And if he was not spiritually equipped to intercede, if he had sin in his life, he would drop dead. They would hear the bells ring, and they would pull him out by the rope. If somebody tries to go into intercessory prayer, and they're not equipped for it, those bells are going to ring. But then chapter 29, verse 1, we become introduced to an elaborate purification ritual. Elaborate purification ritual. And then on the high priest's head covering, it says, Holy unto the Lord. That is necessary for us. 
It was necessary for Jesus, our high priest, the same as it was necessary for the high priest of Israel, and it's necessary for us today. First of all, the scarlet. Before somebody is equipped for intercessory prayer, there must be a repentance of sin in their own life. Or it won't work. Secondly, there's an elaborate purification ritual. We need those bells also. And on our heads, we need holy unto the Lord. Jesus, our high priest, we're told, was a spotless lamb who made intercession. In other words, to make intercession, you have to be clean enough, right enough, and strong enough to do it. When you see people saying they're intercessors for this or intercessors for that, half the time, if not 90% of the time, they don't know what they're talking about. It's not easy to be an intercessor. It requires repentance. It requires somebody who's been purified by the Lord. It requires somebody who's willing to carry that burden. But let's look at Luke chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. It was the turn of the father of Zechariah to be the high priest. He was called to it. He was called to it. In the Old Testament, the high priest had to be from the descendants of Aaron, from the Levitical priesthood. Not everybody was called to be a priest, and not every priest in the Old Testament was called to be a high priest. Every Cohen, every priest in the second temple period was a potential high priest. And because the New Testament teaches every believer is a priest, the priesthood of all believers, which the Roman Catholic Church martyred people for saying, even though it was in the Bible, that's why Cardinal Rao of uh, Florence said that the writings of St. Paul were disgusting and decadent, and people should rather read the Greek and Roman classics. They put the Bible on the index of and banned books. Nonetheless, the New Testament teaches the priesthood of all believers. In the Old Testament, not every believer was a Levite, but every one of the priests was a potential intercessor, high priest. Not every Christian is a priest. Um, every Christian is a priest, but not everyone is an intercessor but they are a potential intercessor. Once again, in Luke 1, 9, Zacharias was chosen high priest, and it wasn't a necessarily a constant job. It was his turn that year. His turn that year. It's one thing to be an intercessor or to intercede, but when you talk about the ministry of intercession, that's something very different. That's Jesus in Hebrews 7, 25. Let's get this clarified. People use biblical terms in non-biblical ways. People use biblical terms in non-biblical ways. This comes from the influences in the early church of Gnosticism. For instance, if you were to witness to somebody who was in the New Age movement and give them your testimony, you would say, you saw the light. They would say, they saw the light. When you say, you saw the light, you're thinking of Jesus in John chapter 1. They're thinking of cosmic illumination or some such thing. So you'll both agree we saw the light, but have two different meanings of light. In ecumenical dialogue between Roman Catholic and Protestant theologians, six to one, half dozen of the other these days. The Protestants will thump on the pulpit and say, we're justified by faith and saved by grace. We're saved by grace. 
And the Jesuit will say, we're saved by grace. Now, the English word for grace is undeserved favor. The Greek word is charism, meaning gift, and the Hebrew word is chesed, meaning God's mercy in the covenant. So when the Christian is thinking about being saved by grace, he's thinking about undeserved favor, he's thinking about God's mercy in the covenant, he's thinking about God's gift. In Roman Catholic theology, grace is an ethereal substance earned by the sacraments administered by a priest. You have sanctifying grace, actual grace, etc. They redefine grace. So the Christian and the Catholic can both agree we're saved by grace, but they have two different definitions of grace. You understand? Today in Restorationism, Kingdom Now Theology, it's the same thing. When people are caught up in this, they're using words like kingdom, triumph, dominion, and unbiblical ways. They'll use the same terms we do, but mean unbiblical things by those terms. Faith. People who have the ministry of intercession are people with the gift of faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. To another faith by the same Spirit. He's talking about a charismatic gift of faith. That is not the faith that we all have. We're saved by grace through faith. Without faith, we can't get saved, but that's not the gift of faith. Paul says we all have a measure of faith. Everybody has a certain amount of it, or you couldn't be a believer to begin with. But then there is the gift of faith. Not everybody has the gift of faith, the same as not everybody has the gift of miracles or healings or prophecy. The body is a body, and different members have different functions. The gift of faith is the capacity to trust God with certainty for something not specifically written in the Bible. I can trust God to meet my needs one way or another and give me the grace to get through the most difficult of times, even when it seems like he's not meeting the need. The Bible says that. I can trust him and have the faith to believe that. If somebody believes with their heart and confesses with their mouth that Jesus died for their sins to give them eternal life, and rose from the dead, they can be saved. They have that faith. You can believe God for what's in his word. But somebody with the gift of faith, the Holy Spirit reveals something to them supernaturally, and they can trust and believe God for it, no matter what the circumstances say. Not everybody has that gift. I don't care what the medical prognosis says. God bless the doctors, but they can't save his life. They can't save her. Yes, but I know that God's going to heal that person. I don't care what the latest biopsy said. God's given me the faith. That person, a person with the gift of faith, will get out of bed 4 o'clock in the morning and pray for 4 hours a day, every day. They have that grace. Sometimes, you know, my grace, I can stay up all night and read the Bible and not go to sleep and go to work the next day and do the same thing the next night. This is my grace. Nothing to do with me. It's something God gave me. And whatever your gift is, something God gave you. But the gift of faith. People with the ministry of intercession are people with the gift of faith. We have two very good examples in the Bible of people with the gift of faith. One is Simeon in the infancy narrative. Remember the old man? He knew he wouldn't die until he saw the Messiah. God showed him that. He was filled with the Spirit, a man who was righteous and devout. And he knew he wasn't going to die until he saw Jesus. His teeth were going, his hair was going, and once again he couldn't get a date. <laughs> but he knew he wasn't going to die until he saw Jesus. He had the gift of faith. Look at Anna the same way. The widow in the temple, for years and years and years and years and years, her whole life was telling people about Jesus when she saw him and doing nothing but praying and fasting and serving in the temple. A whole life of praying and fasting in the temple. Intercession is very, very often associated with fasting. That was her whole life. 
the gift of faith. We don't all have it. We all have faith, but we don't all have the gift of faith. Intercession is one thing, but the ministry of intercession is another. George Mueller from the Plymouth Brethren in Bristol, he had the gift of faith. He'd have all these thousands of kids, these waifs, Dickens characters, street kids. He'd have no way to feed them, no way to house them, no way to take care of these kids. But he had the gift of faith. He would need the modern equivalent of tens of thousands of pounds by tomorrow. And he would pray and he would get it. And he knew he was going to get it. He'd go out and he'd order stuff and have stuff done and stuff, knowing that the money was just as good as in his bank account. We don't all have that gift. But when somebody does, well, if you know anybody who does, ask them to pray for me. <laughs> <laughs> in America, they call these people prayer warriors. I'm not against calling them that, but understand what people with the ministry of intercession really are. They're people who have the gift of faith. I'm not interested in discouraging anybody. I'm interested in encouraging everybody. Look at Joel chapter 2, verse 17. Before Peter's great vision of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's going to come in the last days, what precedes it? Prosperity preaching, kingdom now theology, ecumenism, what precedes this great outpouring that Peter predicts would come in the last days? What is it that precedes it? Joel 2, verse 17. Now in verse 28, we see what Peter quotes in his kerygma in Acts 2. It'll come about in the last days after this, I'll pour out my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men dream dreams, young men see visions. Even on my male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, etc. What makes that happen? Let the priests, the Lord's ministers, Weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O God. Spare thy people, O God. Until the leaders of the body of Christ in this country stop following these connivers from America with their gospel of mammon. And their over-realized eschatology, to put it euphemistically, and begin to weep and mourn and say, Oh God, spare thy people. Until you get leaders like that, this church and this country is going nowhere. Jeremiah 18, verse 20. We call him in Hebrew, Yirmiyahu Hanavi. Should good be repaid with evil? Now, Jeremiah is a major type of Jesus. He's like a sheep led to slaughter, it says. For they've dug a pit for me. Remember how I stood before thee to speak good on their behalf, so as to turn away thy wrath from them. God's wrath was coming, and Jeremiah stood before God on their behalf, to be bruised on their behalf, to ask God to turn away his wrath. And the very people who he interceded for turned against him. The very people that Jesus interceded for turned against him. And if we intercede for this nation, the first thing that's going to happen is the very people we intercede for are going to be the first ones to turn against us. I guarantee it. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23.
Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, but I will instruct you in the good and right way. It would have been a sin against the Lord if he didn't do it. James 4.17 says, He who knows what is right to do and fails to do it, it is sin. Before God raises up an army of evangelists that's really going to deliver the things, things like Jim Challenge never will. Not to knock it. If one person gets saved, it's worth it. But if you really want to see that kind of growth in the body of Christ and that kind of repentance in the church, if you really want to see God begin turning this country around, before God raises up an army of evangelists that can do it, God is going to raise up an army of intercessors that can do this. Real intercession will bring us to a depth that don't, if you've never been there, you can't understand what it is. And it will extract the cost that if you've never paid it, you can't imagine it. But it'll give you a victory beyond your wildest dreams. But let's look what it took. Moses was an intercessor and a major type of Jesus. Look at Exodus 32, 31. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has committed a great sin. They've made a God of gold for themselves. What do you have today? Interfaith worship in Canterbury Cathedral. The Word of God is clear. Deuteronomy 17, 1 Corinthians 10, Demonoi, Shadim in Hebrew. Other gods are demons. Hindu gods, Sikh gods, witch doctors being worshipped in churches. People bowing down to graven images. When the Crusades came back from the East, when the medieval papacy wanted to control the spice trade to control the economy of Europe, they brought back the Muslim and Hindu tradition of counting prayer on beads. Before Shiva, the Hebrew goddess, the uh, Hindu goddess. What have you got today? Idolatry. This country is not only post-Christian, it is neo-pagan. Other gods are being taught in so-called Christian schools. Not about other religions, they're trying to teach children there's a common legitimacy to all religions. A new age philosophy designed to advance social engineering in a multicultural society. Interfaith religion, interfaith worship, God calls it idolatry. Those two things scare me more than anything else. The drugs, the crime, all, all that bothers me. But abortion and idolatry. I know what God did to Israel when they did those two things. And I know what's going to happen to this nation if it doesn't repent of those two things. But what does it say in Exodus 32? What does Moses say? But now if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, please blot me out of thy book which thou hast written. Moses says, blot me out. Jesus said, blot me out. What does Paul say for Israel? My heart's desire is that they would be saved. If it were possible, blot me out. Blot me out. Not for people you like, 
Not for people you love. Not for people who love you. For people who want to kill you. Blot me out. That's not humanly possible. It's something God's spirit has to do. It's only something that he and he alone can put in our hearts. It's a burden that only he can put here. And it's a burden that only he can put here. And once he puts that burden here and here, only he can take it off. But when he takes it off, the victory will be from Jesus. Think about it on the cross. Destitute, afflicted, rejected by the very people he gave himself for, seemingly even abandoned by God. But what a victory. Things are no less desperate today God is looking for intercessors. He's looking for people to take that burden. He's looking for people who are going to know what it is, who are going to count the cost and say, yes, Lord, put it on me. He's going to put that burden on their hearts. He's going to put that burden on their shoulders. But they're going to be people who are themselves repentant, who are themselves purified, and were themselves holy unto the Lord. That's the way it's going to happen. If there is a chance for this country, if there is any hope for the tide of evil to be turned around, it's going to begin that way and that way only. Is God calling you to be an intercessor? I promise you two things. If you accept that burden, in the short term, you're going to regret it. In the long term, you're going to thank God you took it. You will be allotted a portion with the great. You will join Jesus in having that portion with the great. That's where the victory begins. It's good to pray but we need intercession. God bless you and thank you.